Assalamu alaikum. Soil is life. From soil, we grow, we build our houses, we make our clothes, and we sustain the ecosystem. The soil formation takes a long of time. It is stated that on average, forming one centimeter needs about 200 to 400 years. Could you imagine that? Now, what are the soil formation factors and how our soil is basically formed? Today's lecture would focus about this concept. Well, if we look at the soil, there are basically five soil formation factors. And they are actually climate, pair material, organisms, relief, or topography, and time. These, the interaction between these five factors, I mean, it happens at the same time, at the same place, could make the soil happen. We can abbreviate these soil formation factors into C port. C stands for climate, P stands for parent material, O for organism, R for relief, and T for time. Now, in today's lecture, we would be focusing only on the formation of soil from barren material and organisms. So without further ado, let's start. Now, how the soil is formed from the barren material, basically from the rocks. In a simple way, when you have rocks, and these rocks basically are exposed to different climatic conditions exposed to the physical and the chemical weathering. The rocks start to disintegrate, broken down into smaller pieces. The water percolate and the soil microorganisms including and the plant act and do their action. Both the physical and the chemical weathering actually disintegrate the soil and break it down or disintegrate the rocks and break it down to make it the soil. And this is later on what forms soil with different layers that might have different properties. If we talk about formation of soil from barren material, we have to bear in mind different things. Basically, three things. Number one is actually the material by which the soil is formed and the place of formation. Secondly, basically the mean of transportation or how the soil was transported. And finally, the place of deposition where the soil is deposited. Now, when we talk about the material that forms the soil, the material can be organic or non-organic, organic like the plant. And the decomposition of the plant material can become later on organic barren material or if the soil is made of rocks and minerals, which is actually inorganic, inorganic forms, when these rocks and minerals disintegrate and like involved in the chemical reactions, they form, they form the soil. Now, where does the soil form? Is it in place or has been transported? If the soil form in place, then we can call it residual parent material because it has been formed in that particular place. So you have either the plant material or the rocks and the minerals, and they expose or undergo the weathering process by which without transportation from their original place. So they form the soil in the place where the parent material is. And this is, we call it residual parent material. The second stage is that the soil or the rocks might be transported. And it means that there are different ways of transporting the soil. The soil or the rocks can be transported by water or by gravity or by ice or by winds. And depending on the mean of transportation and the place of weathering and the place of deposition, we can have different names for the bare material. For example, if the rocks and the soil are transported by water, then it can be it can be deposited in lake. And if it's deposited in lake, we call it lacustrine. If it is actually transported by water and deposited at stream or by streams, we call it 
alluvium. If it is transported by water and deposited at the ocean, then we call it marine. So now you distinguish the differences between this. If the soil is transported by gravity, just like falling down, and you'll see more details about it, then we call it colluvial. Now, if the soil is transported by ice and deposited by ice, then we call it till or moraine. Whereas if it is actually transported by ice, but then deposited by water, meaning that the ice melt and then becomes water, then it depends where it's actually like deposited. It can be lacustrine if it is at lake, outwash, or alluvial if it is at streams, or marine if it is at the ocean. The material can be also transported by winds. And when it's transported by winds and deposited at lake, then we call it lacustrine. If deposited at, at stream, then we call it alluvial. If it is deposited in like the ocean, we call it marine. While if it is deposited by wind, then we call it aeolian. So we have different different names of payer material depending on actually the three different things that I mentioned here. Now, let's look at more details. If the rocks are actually formed at the same place, then we call it residual bare material. And this is actually what happens, that you have rocks, this rock undergo weathering, and then it disintegrates, and then it forms the soil in situ, in place. And this is, we call it again, residual, residual parent material. Then if you have actually transportation by gravity, it means that you have different types of transportation by gravity. You have, for example, this is your mountain. Then the mountain is actually exposed to different, different things. Then it can actually fall, like in slumping or rock fall or rock slide or whatever action, but the mean that it actually moved from high altitude to lower altitude by the effect of gravity. Then we call it, we call it colloidal depressions. Now, what is more like what is the characteristics of these colloidal depressions that they are actually coarse and stony? Why? Because they were like just transported by gravity from higher latitude to lower latitude without undergoing through a lot of chemical chemical weathering. This is actually very common. You find it closer to the mountain mountain side. If actually the sediment transported and deposited by water, like the case of Wadi, and then deposited somewhere else, like what happens in Al Batana region, then we call it we call it alluvial deposit, alluvial deposit. And this is basically what is most common about it. It's a deep soil, like the one you find in the in El Batane. If you excavate up to one meter, you can find all soil, even without, without single stone. Now, sometime actually the sediment or the sediment can be transported by water and deposit at the ocean side. And in this case, we call it we call it marine. Now, what is the characteristics of marine? Either the wadi brought the sediment and deposited here, or also the wave brought things and deposited at the shore. So it can be two different actions. But the most common things here that you find that the coarser particles are deposited closer to the to the shoreline, and while the finer particle particles can be carried down farther by water. And this is an example also what you can find in Al Batana region. Sometime in some countries, the sediments can be transported by ice. And how this action happens? In a simple way. Now look at this figure. You have actually ice. And what happens that when the ice is exposed to the temperature, it melts. And as it melts, it slumps. And then as it slump, actually, it, it has a friction or it creates friction with the, with the underlying, underlying rocks. And as it moves, it carries with it rocks. So it's like, this is a friction forces leading actually to, leading actually to disintegrate these rocks. And then it can carry them to the place of deposition. This is, we call it glacial, glacial till, and a typical landform is called, is called moraines. 
In some other cases, the material can be transported by winds. And in this case, we call it aeolian. Now, what is the characteristics of the things that are carried by winds? Well, simply that wind can carry the particles for a longer distances. And like you can see here in this picture, like dust, then it will deposit it somewhere else. Now the deposition can, or called actually aeolian, aeolian. You can write it like this or like this. And a famous landform is actually the sand dune. So when you look at the sand dune, you know, and you ask yourself what type of bare material this one, it is simply aeolian. And some other cases, we have something called loss. Now, what is loss? Loss is basically a wind-blown silt. It means that you have, because you have three different types of soils, you have the sand, the silt, and the clay. So basically, this one composed mostly of silt. Why the silt? The silt is easy actually to erode, and then it can be carried out easily by the winds and can travel for longer distances. If this deposited and composed mainly of silt, then we call it, we call it loss. And this is an example, as what you can see here in this picture. Now, the sand dune is mostly full of sand. The aeolian dust, some of the dust can be actually very small in the size, one to 10 micrometer. And this we call it, uh, like we call it particulate matter. And these can be carried for a longer distances, like like what you will see in the next slide. Even the volcanic ashes is considered as deposit that can be carried by winds. So as you can see the type of the landform here, like the sand dune or the Lost Hill, and what you can see also here, the deposit in the China, and also what you can see here in this picture, how the Eolian dust can be actually travel for a longer distances, even can be like, can move from one continent to, to another. Could you imagine that? Simply because they are light in weight and can be carried, carried by the winds. The organic deposit. In a simple way, the organic deposit are basically full of organic. So basically it can be, it can be, it can be either like a plant material or from the animals. In a simple way, if you go to the forest side where you have huge and massive forest. Now, what happens there, you have a wet, cool climate. When these plant material fall on the ground, the soil organisms and the microorganisms decompose these materials. Now, depending on the degree of decomposition, you might see in some of the cases decomposition, but with recognizable plant structure, recognizable plant structure. And this is, we call it peat. Whereas if the decompose completely and you cannot recognize whether you have plant root or anything, then we call it muck. Now, in a simple way, this is basically organic materials that are actually decomposed. And if you look at the peat, for example, 75 of them of the peat deposit exist in Canada and Russia simply because they have actually huge mass of these plants of the forest and also they have cooler, cooler and wet, wet climate. If you look at the organic soil and if you take a handful of soil, the color is really black, it's black. I don't think you will find some in Oman, but if you go to the European countries or you go to areas where they have forest, then you would find this type, this type of soil. It's really so nice, really dark black soil. And you can see if you even excavate, it's full of organic, it's all organic, organic soil, as you can see in this picture. I think this is enough for this lecture. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. And I will leave you with the relaxation time. And I hope that you will enjoy it. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Coming back to it. Well, we forgot that we have also the second factor of the soil formation, which is basically the soil organisms. Now, we have seen from the previous slides how the soil organisms act. So we have vegetation or microbes or soil animals and human is part of them. So basically what happens that the vegetation or microbes or the soil animals, all of them work actually to decompose the materials sometimes even move things from the soil, 
from the upper part to the lower part, mix things, and also helps even in the chemical, in the chemical reactions. And they also create pathways by which the water can pass through them. Now, human is the most influential organism that acts on the soil, simply because his action can be applied at a larger scale. Human has invented machines and has invented a lot of other things that could change the soil significantly. For example, by his action, when he is tilling the soil, he's actually mixing the soil, mixing the down with the up. So this is an, a huge impact, it's changing the level of compaction of the soil. It can also compact the soil. Human also can act chemicals to the soil, whether it's like fertilizers or pesticides or whatever things. And these chemicals change the chemical properties of the soil. Human also act in irrigation and other things. And all of these activities, again, contribute to change the soil significantly. Now, if we take a moment and think about the miracles of the soil animals, you would find that they are really doing like a work that we should not underestimate. For example, look at the picture here to the left. You find at the upper part, you have a dark soil, which is organic soil full of like organic materials. At the bottom here, you have a different soil. It's a different color. But you will notice that you have some black spots existing in this area. Now, think about it, how these spots came here. It's basically because of the, of the soil animals that move the things from the upper part to the lower part and vice versa. If you look at the ants, and I think you can see them everywhere in Oman, you would find that they create their houses like this, but basically they are bringing materials from the lower parts of the soil and bringing them up here. And this really can be, can be a huge impact. Now I will leave you with the relaxation moment and I hope that you will enjoy it. These towering Douglas firs depend on networks of tiny fungus for water and other nutrients. We typically see only the fungal fruits that poke above the soil, mushrooms. But a lot is happening under the surface. Let's dive below ground to take a closer look. Living fungal threads called hyphae connect the mushroom to an underground network of activity. Ants help maintain healthy soil, aerating the dirt, circulating water, and moving nutrients around. Tiny moss mites dine on miniature worms called nematodes. Nematodes consume single-celled amoebas far smaller than our eyes can see. Amoebas devour even tinier bacteria. And bacteria also need to eat. They feed on the remains of previous generations of forest dwellers. In nature, nothing is wasted. The fungal hyphae decompose matter too. And we can follow them toward the roots of the Douglas fir. The fungus wraps around the root tip. Viewing a slice through the root, we see hyphae pushing into the spaces between the tree's cells. At the molecular scale, a chemical exchange takes place. The fungus supplies the tree with much needed minerals, while the tree provides the fungus with energy rich sugars. Nutrients for energy, a fair trade.
I hope that you enjoyed this lecture and see you and take care and see you in our discussion session. Bye-bye.